you so much for that. Um, all right, thank you for uh, for being here and for inviting me to give this talk today. I really, um, this was really fun for me to come back here and um, also just to hear about the, all the exciting stuff that's going on here. I've had a lot of fun discussions and uh, looking forward to having more later today. Um, all right, so I'm gonna tell you about a line of work from my lab that looks at um, uh, a very basic question in neuroscience. Let me get this to work first. There we go. And that is, um, how do we understand neural representations? Right? So that is, what kind of approaches should we use to make sense of neural activity patterns? And typically what we do as cognitive neuroscientists is we do something like representational modeling, right? So we have some theory about the kind of information that might be encoded in a brain region, and we look for evidence that this information is present in the neural signals that we record. So maybe you run a vision study and you have some idea about how the brain might encode information about the spatial layout of the scenes, and then you build a model of that, and you see, is this information present in the activity patterns that I've recorded? But what I'm going to do today is take a step back from representational modeling and address what I think is an even more fundamental question, and that is, what is the nature of the representation itself? Like, what is the statistical structure of the neural activity patterns that we're trying to characterize? And to get at this question, one of the first things that we need to do is we need to understand what is the dimensionality of the neural representations? In other words, how many meaningful dimensions of variance are contained in the representations? And how many dimensions do our theories need to account for? And another thing that we need to do is we need to understand how universal are these dimensions? Are they shared across all individuals that we test or all models that we build? Or are there aspects of the representations that are idiosyncratic? All right, I'm gonna be telling you about this, uh, these concepts of dimensionality and universality um, in the context of human visual cortex and in artificial neural network models of vision. Now the work is gonna focus on vision, but I think that the phenomena that I'm gonna be describing today are, are very general and likely have implications beyond the domains of vision. Okay, now before I get into results, I wanna first talk about, um, just spend some time thinking about why should you care about dimensionality in the first place? Why is this a useful concept for neuroscientists to think about? So first of all, for any field of study, one of the things that we're trying to do, one of the primary things that we're trying to accomplish is to find the point of view on a system Way of or a way of characterizing a system that leads us to simplifying explanations of how it works. Right? We want to have the simplest explanation of how the system is working. And I think that in the quest to understand neural representations, viewing them from the perspective of their latent dimensions gives us this kind of simplifying view. It reveals properties of the representations that would not otherwise be apparent. And I'm going to show you some examples of uh, findings from my lab where we wouldn't have been able to to see these properties of the systems if we weren't viewing them from the perspective of their latent dimensions. Okay, uh, another reason why you might care about dimensionality is that it's one of the key signatures of the computational strategies used by brain systems. And I'm gonna uh, highlight this by just going through a couple concrete examples. So motor cortex is one area in which uh, dimensionality has gotten a lot of attention. So, Despite recording from many neurons in motor cortex, studies consistently report that almost all of the explainable variance in the data is concentrated on a reduced subset of dimensions. And the idea is that you can do dimensionality reduction in this relatively small subset of dimensions that explain the activity patterns in motor cortex. And it's been argued that this has some computational benefits for motor cortex because it essentially reduces the complexity of action plans. It, it means that you have fewer independent components that need to be controlled when you're planning an action, and it makes it simpler and more robust when you're generating action plans. This uh, idea has also had a big influence on uh, brain-computer interface devices. So a lot of systems that interact with motor cortex operate on low-dimensional projections of the motor cortex recordings. Another area where dimensionality has played a theoretical role is in vision. So a long-standing theory of vision argues that the way in which visual computations over the hierarchy of visual cortex or in neural network models, the way in which they accomplish invariant object recognition, they're able to identify things from many different perspectives, is through dimensionality reduction. So that they're sort of compressing the representations, they're doing this information compression to compress the representations into a subset of dimensions that distinguish object categories, 
and that suppress variants along irrelevant dimensions, right? things that might have to do with low-level sensory details. Okay, but not all theories that talk about dimensionality focus on the benefits of low dimensionality. So there are also very compelling theoretical arguments for why you might wanna have high dimensional representations. And two of the most important are the ideas of efficiency and expressivity. So high dimensional representations are efficient in the sense that they're making the best use of the neural resources, right? So if you think about it, there are many neurons in any system that we study. And if it's low dimensional, that means there's just a lot of redundancy across the neurons, right? If it's high dimensional, it means that the coding capacity of that set of neurons is being optimized, right? Using as many dimensions as possible to encode information. Mm -hmm. These things are also expressive in the sense that they allow stimuli to be flexibly categorized and separated in many potential ways, right? So if you have a low dimensional representation, you only have a few axes along which you can uh, separate stimuli or group stimuli. In high dimensional spaces, you can group stimuli and separate them in many possible ways. Okay, so let's get into some findings. So I'm first gonna tell you about a line of research looking at the dimensionality of human visual cortex. This is a project that was led by my student Raj Gothaman and uh, it was in collaboration with Brees Menar at Hopkins. All right, so to do this, we're gonna take advantage of a unique data set. So this is the Natural Scenes data set. It's currently the largest existing fMRI data set of high-level human vision. It's a data set in which subjects uh, viewed, um, each subject viewed 10,000 natural scene images in the fMRI scanner, and they view these multiple times. It's a really high quality data set, so it's ultra high field 70 MRI, um, that's high spatial resolution, and it's also just high signal to noise ratio. Um, so it's, it's a really unique data set, and it allows us to examine the dimensionality of human brain representations at a scale that was just previously impossible to do with uh, previous data sets in the field. All right, this is just to give you a sense of the kind of data that we're working with. So this is just a 2D embedding of the image representations from one subject in visual cortex. Right? And there's just two things I wanna point out here. So first of all, there's a lot of stimuli, right? So 10,000 images and they're each shown multiple times. And I also to give you a sense of the kinds of stimuli that these are. So these are complex natural images and they depict um, a wide variety of different object categories and a wide variety of different scene categories. So a really rich data set um, for characterizing the dimensionality of uh, image representations in the human brain. All right, so now how do we actually do this? How do we actually characterize the dimensionality of uh, image representations? So we're gonna use a, a custom analysis procedure to do this, but to get there, I'm just gonna start with basic principal component analysis, PCA, and then we can build on this to understand what we actually did. So the, the idea behind PCA, it's a very simple idea, which is, you have some data set and it has its original sort of ambient dimension for the voxels and fMRI scanner. And let's imagine every dot is a stimulus for the recorded activity for it. PCA is just finding all the latent dimensions in your data set sorted by the variance along those dimensions, right? So here's PC1, here's PC2, right? And when we do this, we can then generate a really useful summary plot. This is called the Eigen spectrum. The Eigen spectrum is simply plotting the variance along each of these latent dimensions. And what you can get a sense for when looking at these eigenspectra is how the variance is spread across the latent dimensions of the system. So if it's a low dimensional system, like the one here in this toy example, almost all the variance will be concentrated on a reduced subset of dimensions, right? And you can think of the system as basically being described by this subset of dimensions where um, all the variance is concentrated. So it should be a low dimensional system. Now, in the kind of data that I'm gonna be showing you today, the data span thousands of dimensions. So the eigen spectra that we're gonna plot look like this. So they're gonna be plotted on the log log scale and each dot will correspond to the average, um, the average variance or what's called an eigenvalue for a bin of principal components, right? So we're actually spanning the thousands of principal components here, but we're just averaging in bins across the eigen spectrum, just so we can see the trends more clearly. Okay, now there's a couple methodological points that I wanna um, emphasize here that where this differs from standard PCA. Standard PCA is not the right kind of method that you want for characterizing the dimensionality that we're interested in. 
So what we want to do is we want to characterize the dimensionality of stimulus representations. So dimensions that are uh, encoding meaningful information about the stimuli. We just applied PCA to our fMRI data. We're going to have an eigenspectrum that tells us about the signal of interest, the stimulus representation, plus any noise that happens to be present in the data set that we're analyzing. By the way, this type of data that we're analyzing is just a big matrix of voxel responses to all of the stimuli in the study. So 10,000 images by three repetitions. Okay, now this problem of signal and noise, luckily there's a way to handle this and it's through cross-validation. So I'll show you what this looks like in a minute, but the basic idea is that by cross-validating the eigenvalues, we can get a sense for the variance that's reliably stimulus-related and can't be attributed to random noise. So importantly, with this analysis, if you were to apply this analysis to data that's just completely random, the expected eigenvalues would be equal to zero. Okay, there's one other methodological thing I wanna point out here, which is that we're, we're not gonna do just standard PCA when we look at a single data set. We're gonna use a procedure called cross decomposition. So in PCA, what you can do is you can identify the latent dimensions of a single data set. In cross decomposition, what you can do is you can identify the shared dimension between two different data sets. You can align these data sets along their shared latent dimensions. And then you can then get something that's basically the same as an eigenspectrum, except now you're looking at the variance of the shared dimensions between these two data sets. Now, this allows us to do two things. First, when we're analyzing individual subjects, we can look at the dimensions that are shared across different repetitions of the stimuli. But we can also do something that's very uh, useful, which is that we can even align two different subjects along their shared latent dimensions. And we can look for representations that are shared across individuals. All right, so understanding this, we can now look at how we actually partition the data to do these analyses. So we have these matrices of voxel responses to images. And what we can do is we can separate them into the responses to the first presentation of the images and the responses to the second presentation of the images. Right? We can, we can then also split it into a training set of images and a test set of images. So when we do this, we can then apply our cross decomposition procedure. We basically find the shared latent dimensions between these repetitions of the stimuli. And we can then test the cross validated shared variance in the held out test images. Right? So in the end, we get something that's very much akin to a standard PCA eigenspectrum, except all of the values on this spectrum now are robust cross validated estimates of the reliable stimulus related information. Okay, any questions about this? Feel free to interrupt me if you have questions. Yeah. I'm not sure I understand how you, what counts as a shared, if you're your one slide. Yeah. Effect. What counts as a shared latent dimension? Is it just the, say the first rank in both? So this actually will find all shared latent dimensions that are, and they'll be orthogonal to each other and they're sorted by their variant. So like in this data set, for example, this is just two dimensional data set, right. but you can see that, you know, you can align the, dimensions, you can align the data sets along the first dimension, but you can also align them along the second dimension as well. I could just do this for all, all the shared dimensions that you're able to find in your data set. So is it essentially finding a, the, the rotation of the latent stimulus? That's exactly what it is. You're just rotating the two spaces so that they're That's maximally right. aligned. Yep. Thank you. Mm -hmm. If you're, if you've ever, uh, this is very similar to some other methods in the field, like for Krusty's alignment and also uh, canonical correlation analysis, but it, all these things are actually variations on the same underlying math, actually. Okay, yeah. That's right, so it has to, they have to vary across stimuli in this in a similar way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So in this example, it kind of seems like it's, I mean, it doesn't really seem different from PCA, but that's because these, is that because these look like the same. They have this, each individual cluster sort of has the same shape. Right? Yeah, so like in this toy example, because I literally just took the same data set, and, yeah. <laughs> right? So if you just did PCA on each data set, the PCs would correspond to shared dimensions. Right. Okay. But in real data, it's a lot messier. So like if you just do two, if you do PCA on two different data sets, there's no guarantee that you're gonna find a one-to-one -one correspondence between the PCs between those data sets. So this is basically aligning, because think of it as aligning the principal components of two different data sets. Okay. Yeah. Okay. 
Yeah. Yes. That's right. Yep. Okay. Thanks for the questions. So, um, okay. All right. So, what do we actually find when we look at this cross validated eigen spectrum uh, for human visual cortex? So, uh, we're going to be looking at a, uh, a general region of interest, which is basically all visually responsive voxels. I'm going to focus on this for a few analyses that I'll show you. The reason that I'm doing this is just for simplicity. The results that I show you are representative of what we see in all the visual regions that we've looked at. Um, they differ if you look outside the visual cortex, things are noisy or low dimensional, but in visual cortex, um, we see this very consistently. All right, so here's what we find. So uh, each color here is an individual subject in the study. Uh, the blue subject shown in the squares, uh, I just differentiate the subject because we're going to use this as a reference subject for a few other results. Uh, but what we're seeing here is clear evidence for high dimensional structure in the image representations of visual cortex. Right? So we see reliable variants that spans thousands of latent dimensions in human visual cortex. We see no evidence that there's a cutoff at any point in this spectrum. No evidence that we could actually reduce this to a small subset of latent dimensions and account for all the variance in the data. There really seems to be meaningful signal spread across all latent dimensions in the data set. And this is uh, this is very reliably seen in every single subject uh, that we've seen in this study. This is not just a result of looking at a large region of interest. Um, so even if we take smaller regions of interest here, I'm just showing as an example would be one through four. Um, each dot, each color is a uh, different visual region. Uh, again, we see a very consistent pattern here. We see this the same shape of the eigen spectrum with reliable variants spread across thousands of latent dimensions. And we also importantly see no evidence that dimensionality is reducing as we go up visual hierarchy. So one argument that's made about how visual cortex, um, what the computations of visual, visual cortex are achieving. And I want to point out that this is very similar to a recent report in mouse visual cortex with cal calcium imaging, in fact, we see a very, very similar type of eigen spectrum um, where um, uh, this, uh, this particular distribution is a power law distribution. Um, this again is a cross validated uh, type of eigen spectrum. It's slightly different from what we've done, um, but we're seeing something that's very consistent here. It suggests that this high dimensional structure is a very general property of mammalian visual cortex. Um, it suggests that this is telling us something about the coding strategy of mammalian vision. All right, so with these, yeah, do you have a question? Yeah, that's a great question. We don't know yet. So is it the same exact power law? We're still trying to figure that out. So like, it, there's they're slightly different. The human one decays slightly faster. I don't know yet if that has to do with uh, the difference between fMRI and calcium imaging. Yeah. So something that we're really interested in, we'd like to understand. Okay, so, um, so what is this finding telling us? This means that the image representations in human visual cortex are fundamentally high dimensional, right? We can't reduce it to a small set of latent dimensions. And this contrasts with other systems where this does seem to be the case. So there are good arguments for why you might think of motor cortex as having low dimensional structure. And there's been a lot of evidence to support this idea. It seems like in visual cortex, the story is different. Um, it's using a different type of coding strategy. It seems like visual cortex is using a strategy that maximizes its expressivity, its information richness. Um, it's not worried about trying to compress things down to a small set of highly informative dimensions. This also shows that shows us that uh, this signal is that this high dimensional signal is detectable in human fMRI. I mean, we can see signal spanning thousands of latent dimensions, um, and this is, I think, a really important point for cognitive neuroscientists because you know you might have thought that with um, with fMRI the signal was just too coarse to detect this kind of thing. Right, but what we're seeing is that with state-of-the-art neuroimaging methods and with a data set that's large enough, um, we can very robustly detect high dimensional signal in the human brain. And this is really cool because it suggests that, you know, we have the tools that we need to study how the human brain operates in high dimensions. We're not limited by our methods. We're just limited by the scale of our data set. Right, we're only able to see this because this is a very large scale data set. All right, one other thing I want to point out here is that, um, the nature of this distribution is consistent with a power law, where the variance decays as the rank raises in power. In this particular case, it's around negative 1.5, and I'm not going to make a strong claim that that's exactly the right exponent. 
Um, but nonetheless, the idea that it's a power law that suggests that these representations are scale free. And the way that you can think about that is that if you were to look at this distribution at any point along the along the spectrum, it would look essentially the same. Like the shape of the distribution would look, look essentially the, the same. Suggests that if we were to continue collecting more and more data, we would continue to collect to detect more and more latent dimensions. Right? This thing is only bound by the scale of the data set that we have, or ultimately, you know, by the, the finite size of the brain. But for our purposes, it's bound by the scale of the data set. There's no sort of intrinsic bound on the dimensionality within the system itself. It doesn't operate in a low dimensional space. It's using all the dimensions that we're able to detect. Okay, so when we found this finding, um, one of the things we wondered is like, okay, it's one thing to see high dimensional structure in each individual, but a really strong uh, case for the idea that the visual cortex really is fundamentally high dimensional, uses a high dimensional code, would be to find evidence that these things are shared across people. And there's multiple possible outcomes you could imagine here. So it could be the case that only a subset of these dimensions are shared across people. And those are really the core fundamental dimensions of human vision. And that the other dimensions are just some idiosyncratic aspects of individual brain representations. Another possibility is that it really is all of these dimensions that are meaningfully shared across people. Now we could do this because we're using this cross decomposition method. We're gonna use the same type of analysis that I described earlier, but we're just doing one change. Instead of looking at different presentations of the stimuli within a subject, we're gonna look at two different subjects. We do this for all pairs of subjects. Like Right, so what we're doing here is we're finding the shared latent dimensions between pairs of individuals. All right, we're going to plot the same type of eigenspectrum that I was showing you before, but now again, it's information that's shared between subjects. I'm just going to show you relative to subject one for simplicity. These results are representative of what we see for all pairs of subjects. So what we find is, remarkably, there's shared high dimensional structure across all of the dimensions that we're able to uh, measure uh, yeah, between these subjects. I'll just point out, this is a slightly, the scale of the bill is far out because not all of the stimuli were shared across people. So we just, we have a reduced set of stimuli to look at here. But for the set of stimuli that we have, we see reliable information across nearly all ranks of, of, uh, of principal components. Yeah. The question about the pairing, is it um, subject one relative to the other subject or is it? That's right. So what it is, is like, it would be say, take subject one, Actually, yeah, I didn't point this out. So the blue square is actually subject one with themselves. Okay, and then all the other colors would be take another subject and compare it to subject one. Yeah. And to see what are the shared dimensions between that pair of subjects. And was subject one chosen at random? Yeah, yeah. This is representative of what you see for, for any pair of subjects. Mm -hmm. Okay, we took this um, calcium imaging data in mouse visual cortex. It was from a previous study at Stringer et al. 2019. This was the first study that showed that sort of high dimensional structure in visual, cor visual cortex. Um, what they hadn't done was they hadn't done this method of trying to compare across individuals. And so we applied our method to their data. And again, we see something very consistent uh, with what we're finding. So even between pairs of mice, you see shared high dimensional structure in visual cortex representations. If you're interested, we again we see this negative 1.5 exponent here. So again, I don't know um, where they they really focused a lot on that paper on a, the exponent being negative uh, one. Um, we don't know exactly what to make of what how to interpret the exponent yet. Okay, but what this is telling us though is that the high dimensional image representations of visual cortex are shared across individuals. Right, we see this in humans, we see this in mice, um, and we see it even shared between people. And I think this suggests that that high dimensionality really is a central property of the cortical code for vision. If we under, want to understand how vision is working, we need models that account for this high dimensional structure. We're not going to be able to understand it from a low dimensional perspective. And I also just want to point out that to, this is getting at a point that I raised earlier in the intro, that if you want to see this high dimensional structure, you really need to investigate the representations from the perspective of their latent dimensions. Um, this is especially true when you compare across individuals. So if you just assume anatomical alignment between, between people, you don't try to do a rotation across people, you can't see this shared high dimensional structure. Things look lower dimensional. So for example, if you were to do like a typical study and then put everybody into MNI space and average your results, things are gonna look a lot 
lower dimensional than they really would be if you aligned everybody along their shared latent dimensions. Okay, I'm gonna move on to talking about artificial neural networks now, but before I do, are there any questions about this? Yeah. So trying to say that the bottom of the dimension, like they're the same dimensions in the same order, or is it that your alignment procedure makes that? Yeah, so that's a great question. So are they necessarily the same dimensions in the same order? So they're 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 the same dimensions in the sense that they have the same variance across stimuli. Are they in the same exact order? They're not in the same exact order, but they're they don't shift a lot. Like basically, like you know, if you think about like where like the rank might move from individual to individual, but it's not gonna jump like an order of magnitude, all right? Yeah. So there's some local changes in the ranks, but it's not, it's largely this, it's largely, the story is it's largely the same, but you do need this, you need this alignment procedure for two reasons. One is that there is some shift in the rank. And the other is that the way that these dimensions manifest in, in cortical, like, like the voxel responses varies from person to person. So this is basically the Jim Haxby's like hyper alignment story uh, is that like, there are shared latent dimensions between individuals, but if you were to look at just like voxel tuning, it wouldn't be obvious. Um, because the idea is that the story here is that, that there's no reason that, that neurons have to correspond to the latent dimensions of the code. So the latent dimensions can essentially be arbitrarily oriented with respect to the neurons. You could still do the same linear readout. And so you see this in variability from person to person. That make sense? I'm, I'm sure it makes sense. <laughs> yeah, the point is like if you were just do voxel to voxel comparisons across people, yeah. that you just voxels would look idiosyncratic, even though the latent dimensions that okay. if, are are the same, basically. Right. Yeah. So I guess I'm just wondering like how to think of these dimensions, like maybe the first one is animate, inanimate. Yeah, so, good question. So yeah. and this but then you think it goes down to the hundreds and the thousands dimensions yes. that people are voxel away. Yeah, exactly. So that's what so so you know, for us, one of the takeaways from this is that trying to catalog and interpret each of the dimensions is probably not the, the best direction to go in. <laughs> that like there, there are too many of them. It is, a, it is fundamentally high dimensional. And we need the, the way that we're going to get a simplifying explanation of how things work is to try to explain the underlying generative mechanisms that, that give rise to these high dimensional representations, not to catalog each of the dimensions of the representations. Yeah. I think I'm building on Russell's point. I mean, uh, I know I should resist the urge because there is information in all ranks, uh, but it's still tempting to just see some depictions of what these eigenvectors look like, particularly at the you know the high cross validated covariance level. Yeah. Um, and this might pump intuition a little bit about like, oh, okay, so what is the what does drive this ordering of, of yeah, vectors? Right. Yeah. Do you have depictions of these things? We do. You know, unfortunately, I don't have them on the slides right now, but we do. So, so yeah. So. Um, the way that, yeah, the way that I think about this is like, um, we do this for, I'll have some depictions later for some networks that we're gonna look at, artificial networks. Um, you can do that and you see things that jump out at you and they make sense. Part of the reason why I don't focus on them, I, have, I don't typically show them is because I actually think our interpretations of them, of them are often wrong. So we like pick out things that seem semantically meaningful to us. They have like, they capture our intuitions about um, the important properties and images, but I think they don't actually correspond to the things that the neurons are representing. And one of the reasons I believe this is that we see the same exact thing in just completely random, untrained artificial neural network models um, that are like extremely simple. So it's like a three layer convolutional neural network with purely random features. And I'm going to show you this plot so you can see it, it looks meaningful, but it's, I think it's because there are image statistics that co vary with higher level things. and it's really those image statistics that matter, not the higher level interpretations. Yeah. There's no reason that any of these high rank or uh, slow rank um, eigenmodes don't apply to like 20 different questions all lumped into one. Like, uh, yeah, like you're saying, dimension. that they could be dimensions that can be used to make many different distinctions, but like to classify things in many different ways to say, like, this is animate versus in inanimate or yeah, it's yeah. a certain kind of thing. Yes, or this versus this. that's a good point. Else. Okay, so that's actually something, yeah, yeah. So 
we so I'm going to show you some results in artificial neural networks where we think that actually there's like a universal set of dimensions that can be used to do many different types of tests. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. If the last three people all ask you the same thing, what is it taking one more time? Uh, you got an eigenspectrum, I got an eigenspectrum, we're locating the axes, we're both of that. So, in what sense are you asserting that something is shared between me and you? So, in a training set, we can I can say align our, our the latent dimensions of our neural population to those. And then in a test set, yeah. I can estimate the reliable covariance of those dimensions. And in permutation <coughs> tests, the expected value, like I didn't show you this here, but you can put key values on this, and they're all highly significant. So in permutation tests, the expected co covariance would be zero. So, so by chance, we're not going to find reliable covariance between our brains if there's nothing shared between them. Uh, they, wouldn't, they wouldn't generalize to our test set. But when we uh, generalize to the test set, we see reliable covariance. It suggests that there's something meaningful that's shared between our brains that um, you don't you wouldn't find it by chance. Yeah. 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 I think I'm gonna ask a different question. Yeah. It's gonna be a dumb question. I don't know if you worry it's a dumb question, but given like the years and years of research on signal noise absorbing in these scenarios, you know, and you know, spatially organized uh, um, information on color, you know, meaning you know, retrocopically organized things. Yeah. And then uh, spatial frequency, motion, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, wouldn't you expect a high frequency, this kind of outcome? I mean, it, isn't it like if you didn't get this pattern, would you say that, oh, the brain is responding to different things than we expected, or that fMRI just doesn't collect the data? Yeah. So, okay, so there's two things here. So, one is that, um, you know, there's been a lot of theories about. Visual cortex as doing an, art, an artificial neural network model too, as doing essentially information compression. That is, it's basically taking this high dimensional sensory signal and extracting this low dimensional set of uh, representations that's highly useful for behavior. Um, and uh, and so um, and in fact, in the like the mouse work that I showed you briefly, where they the first reported this power law in biological vision. Um, that was a very surprising find. So the point of that study was actually to try to, uh, they, they collected a large data set of mice and they wanted to say, how many dimensions are there? So to stay in our data set, we should find where the limit is in dimensionality. People have tried to do this before in smaller data sets. They tried to like extrapolate. It, uh, it's, been, it's been proposed in some previous work that maybe there's like a hundred-ish dimensions of object representation in high-level primary cortex. Um, what you find is that when you scale the data up, Things don't saturate. Dimensionality doesn't reach an upper bound. It just keeps going. Given that we can discriminate as thousands and thousands of different types of yeah. mice or apples. Yeah, you don't, it turns out you don't really need that. Like, so, like 100 dimensions, you can discriminate a lot of things with 100, 100 dimensions. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so, it's, so it's yeah, from, we're trying to appreciate the, find, the, the implications of finding it hard to do because it, it doesn't appear. Like what you would expect. Yeah, I see what you're saying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so even 100 dimensions is, is very high dimensional, actually. So you can do a lot with that. Um, and, and the thing is, like, there are reasons that you think, like, there are reasons to think that there are benefits to low dimensionality. So, for example, you know, when you want to, like, reason about the world and act on things, um, you presumably want to have a fairly reduced set of dimensions that you're using to, like, do, to, like, plan your actions or to guide your decision making. And if you're trying to sample, Tens of thousands of dimensions and can consider all those things. Um, you know, it, it just it just makes action planning I think fragile. Um, and so uh, there are scenarios where you might want low dimensionality, but it seems to be in sensory representation that's not the case. Yeah. So taking one more bite of this. That, so to, to refute the claim that there's some dimensionality reduction or compression happening across different areas. Wouldn't you have to then also show that then the eigenvectors cannot be blocked in the line of rotation across visual areas? So train V1 and then test again. Then right. So I don't have that here, but that's right. So like there's more shared variance. So like you could take two individuals and compare like V1 to V1 or right. V1 to V2. There's more, there are more shared dimensions within a region than across regions. Okay, so okay, so at least the dimensions start to not be quite as shared. 
if you if you do uh, between the region. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right, well, that's helpful. So that, that tells you at least that there's something about there's transformation. Yeah, that's happening. There's a transformation, it's just not compression. Yeah, that's right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All of this high dimensional high dimensionality, low dimensionality talk is under the caveat. This is all linear, right? So yeah, so that's a great question. Intrinsic dimensionality. Yeah. So it's a really great question. So so we're looking at linear dimensionality. Um, so sometimes people make a distinction between linear or embedding dimensionality and intrinsic dimensionality. And the logic here is that, okay, so you could have a relatively low dimensional object that's embedded in a high dimensional space if that object is curved, right? And so maybe natural image representations are this sort of like curved manifold that lives in a high dimensional uh, linear space. And then if you really want to understand the dimensionality, you want to know the intrinsic dimensions of that manifold, right? Like to give an intuitive example, like you could take a circle and you could like arbitrarily rotate it in a 3D space, right? And you would need three linear dimensions to describe that circle. But really, you just need like one intrinsic dimension to know where you are along that circle, right? Um, yeah, I mean, there are some ideas that the vision might be described by a low dimensional intrinsic manifold. I, I am very skeptical of that. So I, I think that for several reasons. One is that in the end, neurons need to do a linear readout. So the thing that really matters is what's accessible to a linear readout. Um, and the other is that, you know, when you try to do these estimations of intrinsic dimensionality, they're really, really finicky and they're really sensitive to like the details, uh, like noise in the data. And so, so it's just like, it's really hard to even get a sense of intrinsic dimensionality. And actually seems like to even estimate it reliably, you would need this, the, the order of data that you would need to do that is just astronomical. Like you, I think you would never really be able to do it in any realistic setting. So um, it's possible that that's the case. I just, I, I'm skeptical that it's that that's the right way to understand it. I'm also skeptical that we'll ever really be able to understand it in that way any anyway. It's just like with the methods that we have, we're never really gonna be able to do that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, so maybe what I'll do is I'll move on to the neural network modeling stuff we're doing because part of the answer to that I think is that we need computational models. I mean, I think that's the kind of explanation that we need. Um, and I I do think that there. So we're working on some of this stuff now. I think that we can have simpler computational models than the current deep learning models that most people are using. Um, I think that can give you some kind of in, the kind of insights that you're talking about, but it's more about computational theories, uh, not about how you do like how you transform sensory inputs rather than uh, looking at the dimensions and describing them with language, basically. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, we're going to look at artificial neural networks now. I'm going to go through some of this kind of quickly, just uh, given the time. So, all right. Um, so we're going to be focusing mostly on convolutional neural networks. Right, so these are at a very high level. These are biologically inspired hierarchical models that take image inputs and they perform a series of nonlinear transformations on the inputs. Um, the idea is that they're they were roughly inspired by the organization of primate visual cortex, this hierarchical structure in primate visual cortex. The parameters of these models are set through deep learning on computer vision tasks. Uh, we really don't know yet how to just hand engineer or tune these models ourselves so that they give rise to brain-like representations. Um, we need to, you know, what people in the field are doing is they just train them to do things like object classification and brain-like representations emerge. But they're useful, you know, even though they're really engineering tools uh, as a starting point, they're useful to neuroscientists because they can give us some insights into how populations of neurons might transform sensory inputs to make behaviorally relevant information explicit in their representations. Um, and just to motivate why these things are interesting to look at, um, this is like an old finding now, but uh, uh, what I want you to take away from this is that each bar is telling you something about the similarity of a different computational model to high level visual cortex, so the image representations in, in the human brain. The three models here are what we had before deep learning and before convolutional neural networks. And, and this is the performance once we got convolutional neural networks, right? So you can see why neuroscientists are so interested in these. I mean, they're just remarkably good at explaining brain responses to images. Now, most of the work on these models focuses on 
details of the tasks that they're trained on or the architecture that you create for them, with the idea being that you know the certain tasks specialized representations emerge in these networks and they give you a correspondence to a specific brain region. I'm going to be coming uh, looking at these networks from the perspective of these statistical um, concepts that we just talked about of dimensionality and universality. Yeah. By universality, do you mean that the I I that pattern sort of the, I mean the the power power index? No, actually, I'll show you a result. Uh, it's it's more than that. It's that they're actually the same latent dimensions across networks. That's the idea. Yeah, it's not just that the pattern of the eigen spectrum looks the same. It's actually that the dimensions are shared between networks. Yeah. Okay. Again, I was going to come back to this idea that you know why is dimensionality a relevant concept for these models. Um, so one reason is that it's in, uh, it's had a prominent role in theories of how these models operate. So one of the sort of leading theories that's been around for a long time now is that these models are doing this information compression. They take set of object um, concepts that have these like really high dimensional representations of sensory inputs, and they compress them down to lower dimensional manifolds that just highlight the key semantic distinctions between objects and sort of get rid of irrelevant sensory details. All right, but you can see there's a bit of a tension between that thinking about how the visual hierarchy works and the kind of result that I was just showing you, which is that basically all throughout visual cortex, we see the same high dimensional structure, right? So this led us to ask a really simple question, which is what does the dimensionality look like in the best computational models of visual cortex? Are the best models ones that learn low dimensional image representations that just highlight key semantic dimensions or the ones that have high dimensional structure? All right, so this is a work that was led by uh, one of my former students, Eric Almaznino. I'm gonna, uh, yeah, in the interest of time, I'm gonna go through this kind of quickly. The basic idea here is that we're gonna examine a bunch of different uh, neural network models. We're gonna compare them to um, representations in visual cortex of images. These are ob uh, object images. In this particular data set, it's electrode recordings and monkey and high-level monkey visual cortex, but the results are representative of what we see in human fMRI as well. The basic idea is that we just learn a simple linear mapping from the model's representations to each of the, uh, the units in this multi-unit recording. Right? We learn that mapping and then held out data, we test the ability to predict the brain activity. So this is what's sometimes called an encoding model. And then some of the plots I'm gonna have, it's called an encoding score. Basically how well does this model do at predicting brain responses? For these models, we can also then look at their latent dimensionality. So we just plot their eigenspectra for natural image representations. Just feed a bunch of images into the model and plot their eigenspectra. And we're gonna look at models that are trained on a variety of different tasks, um, including different supervised and self-supervised tasks. And, um, I just want to highlight that these tasks really do vary a lot. So there's sort of standard types of tasks on ImageNet, but also um, I'll just zoom on, zoom in on a few examples. Sort of weirder tasks, so that you think would require very different types of representation. So semantic segmentation, so like you know drawing a line so that on each of the objects in the scene, so separating the objects. Surface normal, so mapping out the 3D structure and orientation of surfaces in the scene, and even weird tasks like solving a jigsaw puzzle. So like cut the image up into pieces, move it around and ask the network to put it back together again, All right? So things that you might expect to elicit very different types of representations. But what we're gonna do is we're gonna just look at the eigenspecter of these models. Um, and I'm gonna, in some of the plots, I'm gonna uh, show a metric called effective dimensionality. Just a way of taking an eigenspectrum, like a complex plot like this and just converting it into a single metric. The basic idea here is that if effective dimensionality is higher, that means that variance is spread across more latent dimensions. And if it's lower, variance is concentrated on the small set of latent dimensions. Okay, so what I'm gonna plot here are the eigenspectra for all the neural network models that we analyzed. And I'm gonna color code them according to their performance and explaining brain responses. Right, so each line here is a different neural network. Red lines are ones that are better at explaining uh, brain responses to images, and blue models are ones that are worse at explaining brain responses to images. Okay, so what you can see here is a very clear trend in which the best neural network models of visual cortex are the ones that have 
uh, slowly decaying ion spectra. Okay? And the ones that are worse neural network models of the visual cortex are the ones that have most of their variants concentrated on a subset of dimension, and then it rapidly, rapidly drops off after that. And we can convert this into, um, into uh, a scatter plot, where now each dot here is a neural network model. On the x-axis, I'm plotting this effective dimensionality metric that I just told you about. It's basically just converting the eigenspectrum into a single number. And the y-axis is the coding score, this means how well does it do at predicting brain responses. And there's a very clear, strong relationship between dimensionality and encoding scores. Right, so the, high, the, the models that have high dimensional structure are better at explaining brain responses. And I just want to highlight again, like these are models that vary in a lot of things. They're trained on different data sets and you know, things like that. Right? It turns out that in this set of models, the tests don't really seem to matter that much. What matters is the richness of the image representations that they've learned. Mm -hmm. Well, now the idea is that some tasks are good at learning high dimensional representations. Some tasks only require low dimensional representations. And it's so the, basically it's like the correspondence between these models in the brain is not explained by the task per se. It's not like, oh, these are the correspondences have to do with the fact that there's certain task specialized representations that this model has that this other model has. I, I'm going to show you results to point to this idea later, which is that um, they're all basically learning the same dimensions. It's just that some of them learn more and some of them learn less than dimensions. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so what this is showing us is that the best CNN models of visual cortex have high dimensional image representations, right? So uh, this really goes against the idea that what these models are doing over the course of learning is compressing information. I mean, information compression, I think, is not the right way to think about these things. What they're doing is they're learning rich image representations that allow them to make many interesting distinctions among stimuli and things that are relevant to how humans process stimuli. Um, and I, this points to this idea that you know both biological and artificial neural networks rely on an expressive high dimensional code um, for solving challenging visual tasks. They don't compress things down to low dimensional manifolds. They, use expressive codes to do this. Um, and uh, I'll just very quickly point out that um, we did a transfer learning study where we tried to train these networks to do new tasks in a new set of categories. The models that have high effective dimensionality are much better at generalizing to new categories. Right? So learning this rich expressive set of representations allows these models to generalize to new, um, to new domains of stimuli, new domains of categories. <clears throat> Okay, uh, I'm gonna try to go through the last two studies kind of quickly in the interest of time here. So, um, so one of the things that we wondered after we saw these results is, well, if the task is really just like serving to boost the dimensionality of image representations, could you potentially get there with just untrained random models? So this is a project that was led by my student, uh, Atlas Kazamian. So the idea here is that we, we took a, very simple convolutional neural network of three layers. And we're going to just increase the number of random channels in the third layer of the network. We're going to compare this just as sort of a reference point to AlexNet and uh, both untrained and trained AlexNet. And what we're doing here is it's the same sort of encoding model procedure. In this particular case, we're looking at the NSD data. So it's image representations in the human brain. Uh, but again, we also see the same result in, in the monkey data too. All right. so. First, we, this is just comparing Alex to the brain representations. So this is a classic result that's been reported in the field for a long time. Untrained AlexNet is actually pretty good. It's not that bad, right? It's highly statistically significant. But then if you add the training, so this is a pre-training to do image net classification, you get this boost in performance, right? And it's long been thought that this boost in performance really relies on task-specific training. Like you need to train the model to do something useful and then you get this boost in similarity to human brain representations. So here's what happens if we just take a completely random untrained network and just increase the number of channels in the third layer. You basically reach the level of Alex net level performance with this random untrained network. So what this is suggesting is that finding these brain relevant dimensions is actually not that complicated, right? You can get there through just high dimensional random sampling of images. 
they just fall out of natural image statistics. Um, this holds even if you reduce the dimensionality of this model through PCA. Right? So you could take this model, the 10,000, uh, this model has 10,000 random channels. You could do PCA on that model so that it matches the dimensionality of AlexNet and it still performs as well as AlexNet. Right now, so what this is showing us is that you need to search around in, in representational space to find these dimensions. You need these 10,000 random channels to find it. But once you, you know, once you sample a lot of directions of variance, just natural image statistics will give you the useful dimensions from that. They'll just like if you just do PCI on that, you're going to get the useful brain dimension, the brain relevant dimensions. Okay, I'll skip over this so I can show you the next thing, but I'll just quickly tell you that you can't get this with any network. So you can't get this with a fully connected connected network. Um, it's really specific to convolutional architectures. There's something about the interaction of natural image statistics and convolutional architectures that these things just naturally fall out. Oh, and this is getting to this point of inspecting the dimension. So this is the untrained network. Now you see a lot of things that look naturally meaningful, like a C cluster, SM cluster, C order, and so The very, I mean, the things that you might be inclined to interpret as semantically meaningful, they just fall out of natural statistics in convolutional architectures. Okay, so I'm gonna very quickly tell you about this last finding related to universality in these networks. So I've shown you two findings that suggest that task-specific training in these networks is really not important for understanding their similarities to the human brain. You can get brain-relevant dimensions in many different ways. Uh, there's nothing special about the tasks that, um, that are being used to train these models. So what we wanted to do is see, is it the case that actually all of these models are basically just learning the same thing, a universal set of representations? So the way we did this was to take many different uh, deep neural network models and extract their latent dimensions and then compare latent dimensions across models. So we can say, for a given dimension, do we see this dimension in many different neural networks? Okay, and we can compute a summary statistic from that called the canonical strength. So dimensions that have high canonical strength are ones that you are found in many different ANN models. And ones that have low canonical strength are ones that are just idiosyncratic. You only see them in a specific model. Okay. For these dimensions, we can also compute a brain similarity network, which is going to plot on the y-axis, which is, is this dimension also found in the human brain? All right, so we say on the x-axis, we're trying to estimate are these dimensions universal across many different models? On the y-axis, we want to know, are these dimensions also found in the human brain? Yeah. Yeah, it's a cross-validated prediction accuracy. That's right. OK, so I'm going to show you a few different examples of this. The way these plots work is that each dimension here, or each point here is like a principal component from a neural network. There's many neural networks. There's many principal components in it. At this point, over the course of all the things we've looked at, we've probably looked at millions of latent dimensions. Uh, we've looked at this in so many different networks. Um, we're going to, uh, a useful way to, to look at this is to just extract the um, the, quanti the average value of quantile bands and just look at their, uh, the trend, um, the main trend in the data. Because there's a lot of density here that you can't really see um, in these points. There's so many of these points. Uh, there's a lot of density concentrated on the center there. But what we're seeing here is that there's a very clear trend where dimensions that appear to be universal across different neural networks appear to be shared with the human brain. And the ones that are idiosyncratic and they only show up in a subset of networks are far less likely to be found in the human brain. We see in all the analyses that we've done, we've looked at this in many different ways, we almost never see points of an upper left point uh, quadrant of this plot. Right? So that would be points where it shows up in a specific model. Like you might think that like, I have a special model that's really good at learning just the right representations, and that's going to give me the best brain, uh, the best thing for explaining brain responses. And it's special. I don't see the representations in other networks. That would be something up here. We never see that. Right? So the things that are shared with the brain are shared by many different networks. You don't need something special to find them, basically. All right, I'm going to remove uh, the background points there and just show these uh, these quantile bins. Instead, I'm going to show you a few different variations on this. So the first thing I showed you, I didn't specify this, but this is a this is a case where we really expect this to work. So these orange points are 
networks trained on the same task and the same data set with different random seeds at initialization. So we'd like to see that they learn shared representations in the end, and that's what we find. But what I'm gonna show you now is that this holds up, even when we can compare networks, that should be learning different types of representations, right? So these are networks in blue, they were trained on different tasks, right? So some of them were image class or object classification, scene classification, a variety of different self-supervised learning tasks. The tasks don't really matter. What matters is the degree to which the dimensions are universal across different architectures. Here, we took models that were a variety of different architectures now. So that's the green box. So these are a huge variety of architectures. So it's like classic uh, convolutional architectures, more modern convolutional architectures, and even vision transformers, which look very different from convolutional architectures. And what we can see here is there's a very strong correspondence. And it's almost a one-to-one -one mapping here where the universality of these metric, of uh, these dimensions across models tells you whether they're going to be, uh, you're going to find them in the brain. All right, so what this is showing is that dimensions that are shared by many different neural networks are also shared with the human brain and suggests that these systems are likely relying on a set of universal representations, right? They emerge in many different settings. They're largely driven by image statistics and you don't need specialized architectures or tasks to find them. All right, so to wrap things up here, so what I've shown you is that visual representations in the human brain are fundamentally high dimensional, right? And this contrasts with um, uh, older theories about how uh, visual hierarchy works, and it contrasts with the known properties of other systems in the brain, like motor cortex, uh, where it's thought to operate in low dimensions. It suggests that the sensory code in vision really emphasizes expressivity. It's a, it's a different type of code. Um, we also see this high dimensionality in the best computational models of visual cortex. And I just want to point out that I think, you know, we've had a discussion about this already throughout the talk, which is that I think this points to the idea that we probably don't want to go in and try to catalog all of these dimensions. The thing that, the way that we're going to gain simplifying insights into how the system works is not by probing each of the individual dimensions, but instead trying to under, identify simplifying underlying generative mechanisms that give rise to these representations. Um, I mentioned this a few times, latent dimensions are really, I think, are the right way to look at this. So a lot of the phenomena that we've just talked about are not as clear or just not protectable if you try to examine neurons or voxels. So for example, that uh, universality across models, if you just look at like individual neurons in neural networks, that trend is there, but it's a lot weaker, it's a lot messier. If you look at the latent dimensions, you see that it's really the latent dimensions that are shared and universal across networks. Finally, I think all of this points to this idea that these diverse systems, biological and artificial vision systems, all share a set of universal visual representations. And what's exciting about this is that it suggests that even though these systems are high dimensional and very complex, there may be some very simple underlying principles that give rise to the representations that they're learning. Right? The fact that they emerge so generically in many different settings suggests that there's some simplifying explanation. I don't know what it is yet, but uh, I'm excited to try to figure it out. And uh, I'll just point out that um, uh, if you're interested in the methods, I, my lab uh, recently did a tutorial at the Cognitive Computational Neuroscience uh, Conference on these methods. And if you go to my website, there's a CCN tutorial link uh, there that you can see. We have a, uh, my students put together like a really, really excellent walkthrough of all of these methods um, and you can, uh, with, with code and you can go through it. And uh, yeah, thank you so much for your attention. I have a question about the argument that uh, information suppression is not protected. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the number of dimensions we have, actually, you know, high dimensionality of the composition is still lower than the dimensionality of the group of the Well, in our case, because it's. So, um, yeah, so, okay, so or, so there's two things here. So one is that in the neural networks, uh, that's right. So I think in the neural networks, um, I think that currently, I think it's only a reduced subset of the dimensions in the neural networks that are shared with the human brain. It's not all of the dimensions in the neural networks. And in fact, like, I, so I'm showing you, like those plots where we're looking at like the what dimensions are shared across networks. It's the things that are shared across networks that are shared with the human brain. But it, the things that aren't shared, like the the, Dimensions that are specific to individual networks are actually useful for the tasks that they're doing. It just turns out that they're not <coughs> useful for explaining brain responses. 
Um, but in the human brain, uh, I think that really all of the dimensions are, that you really can't, you, you can't do dimensionality reduction without a loss of information. You're not just throwing away noise, you're actually throwing away meaningful signal. If, if we think that it truly is a power law distribution, it suggests that there really is, the cutoff that we observe is just the, the finite scale, driven by the finite scale of the data set. It's not inherent to the system. It could still be the case, for instance, that uh, if you know, let's say the dimensionality of the neural representation is equal to the dimensionality of the simulated chip. Yeah. Kind of hard to quantify. It could be the case that you know the more informative dimensions, more valuable dimensions are allocated more resources. Oh, I absolutely think that's true. So, like, so I think that the the variance along those dimensions is telling you something about their importance. Right? right. Yeah. And so the high variance dimensions are going to be the ones that will that will that will be most useful for doing that. You can like you can do a wide variety of tasks, probably with just the first 10 dimensions. Right. You can already get like pretty good. You can get like pretty good accuracy. Um, but if you want to so if you want to get increasing accuracy and get up to like human level behavioral performance, I think you need that long tail of high dimensional representations. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome talk. Thanks so much. Um, I'm trying to understand what you are saying about learning, if anything. Like, is there a role for learning in the story? We set up our visual representations over time mm -hmm. with that as a function of our experience of the world to some extent. I mean, there is some variance that would need to be explained by what you experience in the world, but these models don't need to learn anything. So, um, like the neural network models don't need to learn anything. Yeah, some of your neural networks. Oh, like the untrained yeah, the networks. Untrained. Yeah, that's right. Okay, so let me just clarify. So, like the 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 takeaway that I want to make from the from the uh, the takeaway claim that I want to make from that from the untrained network is not that like visual cortex is just like random dimensionality expansion. It's that um, the dimensions that are encoded in visual cortex do not require some task specific learning to like, they can, they naturally fall out of natural image statistics. Um, and I, I don't have the model for this yet. We're working on this, but I think that there are simpler learning principles that just operate locally at each layer um, and just extract the statistics of the previous layer that can give rise to, um, to brain-like representations and might be a more biologically plausible learning mechanism than like test specific back propagation of some, you know, tests specific signal yeah great talk uh so i love the idea of it's all you know, image statistics mm -hmm. or image statistics but i'm wondering if there's a potential that this is actually maybe reflecting more of an indictment on ImageNet and its lack of variability okay so you think about like complex object recognition you can recognize objects across a huge variety of image mm -hmm. and Things I would expect a neural network that's not trained to link to very disparate like, visual inputs as the same thing. Yeah. Could you do a more targeted uh, approach to like choose an image set where these things just don't have the same image covariances that you then train and see does the network learn back? Um, yeah. So you're saying like, can you get networks that learn? So like things look universal when we consider networks that are trained on ImageNet or image, and not all of those are trained on ImageNet, but yeah, ImageNet-like yeah. type things. And, um, uh, but then if you had a more challenging, or yeah, maybe there's like specialized data maybe sets. ImageNet is yeah. variable, right? Like, yeah, I it, see what you're saying. You like to yeah. think it captures our, our typical experience. Yeah, maybe yeah. It, it has its own biases. Like yeah, I see what you're saying. Okay, there's, yeah, it's a good question. So there's two, there's two things here. So like one is that, I should clarify that like the kind of thing that I'm trying to explain is just like feed forward visual visual processing. So it's actually, I think like fairly simple. It's not visual cognition like writ large. And I, I'm sure that, you know, more complicated things are happening uh, beyond just the feed forward processing that these models are not gonna account for. Um, and we already know that, uh, but um, right, so this is only trying to account for like th this, this one aspect of visual computation. Uh, the other thing is that 
in general, that what we've seen is that it doesn't really matter what the stimulus set is. Now, the thing is, I don't know, maybe we haven't tested the right stimulus set. Maybe there's like, a, maybe somebody needs to design like just the right stimulus set that changes things here. It's like more challenging, it's more representative of human visual experience. But for our purposes, all the things that we see in the neural networks are representative of what you get from any random set of, uh, of natural images. I mean, it has to be sufficiently large. If you have a small image set, then you know things can differ from image set to image set. But once it's large, any set of natural images will give you the same principal components in a network, basically. I guess, how does the length space if we do pixelized similarity of the image net similarly relate to the length space of the network? That uh, that's a good question. I don't know. Yeah, we haven't looked at that. So, like, just do PCA on the pixel values. Yeah, it's a good question. Those yeah. are highly correlated, with possible. Mm -hmm. the yeah, they're yeah, that's a great highly, question. They, they're they're more correlated. Yeah, we should look at that. We haven't done that. Yeah, that's a great question. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Let's spend a little time about the intuition on the second part. Mm -hmm. It seems to me that you told me uh, that you have these networks that are not like random things and they have random versions. Yeah. And yet somehow this, so I put something in there that would be random, you know, and you're saying, but this predicts what happens in the range. Yeah. Uh, but as you mentioned, this only happens for the convolutional That's the right. networks. So yeah. If there is a convolution, like basically a random pop Convolution yeah. Structure. Yes. Yeah. But basically, what you're saying is that it's just that that sort of a it's enough. It's the it's the <laughs> yeah. So it's but so you're not saying a random network of any random. It can't be arbitrarily any random network. Yeah. So the architecture matters has to be convolutional. And like you know, you could you could create a network that would perform poorly. So you could say like. I'll just going to set all the weights and all the filters to one, right? And it's never going to extract anything, right? right. So, so you have to have some variation in the filter weights. Um, so we're actually now, like, the student who led that project is now working with a set of models where we just can engineer the features in each layer to... Because essentially what's going on here is that random filters are still doing, like, a spatial frequency decomposition of the image. Okay. And so that's what's happening. So you basically have spatial frequency decomposition at multiple spatial scales with nonlinearities in between. Mm -hmm. um, and you do that locally, so with the convolution. Yeah. So those are the ingredients, I think, that get you almost all of the way there. Um, in terms, of, at least in terms of explaining like feed forward visual computations, um, you know, these, these models aren't great at doing things like image classification. I mean, they can do it, but it's not like, they're not gonna perform at the level of like trained AlexNet. Um, but as far as like brain responses to images, they do really, really well. I mean, maybe that gets back to what John was asking earlier, which is saying, oh, we have this random topic organization, so we should kind of expect that. And it's a sort of theme here. It's just like, is this high dimensional stuff just the fact that your brain doesn't try to reduce the object you're looking at to a categorical dot? It, it has all these random topic representations that retain a lot of information. Yeah, although the argument has long been that uh, the receptive fields get so large in high level visual cortex yeah. that that's not really contribute. Like at that point, you're starting to get something that's like much more abstract and the, the, um, the spatial um, information is not the main driver of the dimensionality. Um, and that you're, you're um, you know, that, and that's part of why you get low dimensional structure in high and high level regions is because you're basically averaging over larger regions of space, essentially. Yeah. But it's, but essentially what's happening, the way that we're thinking about it is that like, even though the spatial, dimensionality is decreasing across layers, the feature dimensionality is, is, is high, it's still high, basically, right? The, not like the, the variety of different image features that are being encoded remains high. Yeah, I was wondering if you think uh, low dimensionality and motor representations might be related to just the way more than the dimensionality. I do think that actually, yeah. So like, I, I think that actually motor cortex is probably also high dimensional and that the studies that have led people to make claims about low dimensionality are, are, are really just driven, like the low dimensionality is just the consequence of simple experiments, not that much variability in what the animals are doing and so on. Yeah. For the for these like more different studies, but like you're because you're not looking at uh, you're looking at the activations, but perhaps that's like a later layer 
uh, in the motor social studies that there, there, that there's some complex high dimensional space before they get to the spot where they're measuring. I don't know if that makes any sense um, at all. Yeah, our, like, like, are you like you're not measuring cognition, you're kind of you're getting to the part. Yeah, I see what you're saying. Like there's some high dimensional space that precedes like the final output of motor cortex or yeah. whatever, and then it gets compressed right at the final output. But, uh, yeah, that's a possibility. I, I don't know. Yeah, that's a good, a good thought. Yeah. For the first part of talk, the brain data, how far forward can you look in visual cortex? So, okay. So what we've done so far is we've looked at, um, uh, We've looked at all of the retinotopically defined regions in NSD and all of the um, functionally defined regions. So that includes like you know FFA and PPA and things like that. And um, and we've looked a little bit at some anatomical ROIs like anterior and ventral temporal cortex. And in general, the story is the same across all regions, except that as you start to get more and more anterior, you basically just see like the whole spectrum just starts to like shift downward. Um, so it's just like a it's just like a global decrease in SNR. It's not like a change in the shape of the spectrum. Have you compared like dorsal ventral? So it looks the same in dorsal and ventral. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. But we haven't really done like a deep dive into that. I mean, we've just like generated this for all the ROIs and everything looks I mean, I don't know the what same. You think about dorsal, but so much stronger evidence for a higher degree of ventral. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Is, the architecture might differ. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's a good question. Yeah. It seems to be the same across all these regions from what we've looked at so far. Yeah. So, can I just ask one? I think the whole study, I think we have is to study some theory that, well, there's a critical point at this kind of a, uh, eigenspectrum. Uh, when it's larger than a critical point, yeah. it's becoming like more uh, efficient coding. The yeah. But the, the, the low end is kind of more smoothly. Kind of, kind of sort of uh, downloadability and the differentiability of the trade off between that. Would you say that is, is a possible potential? Uh, yeah, so, yeah, so that's a really great, great question. So, I showed you some uh, mouse data, um, and uh, they argued in that mouse data. Um, actually, why don't we just do this? I'll show you this in neural networks. So, they argued in the, in the mouse uh, data that, that it's a that, they, that basically they found in all the mice that they analyzed, they never found an eigenspectrum that decayed more slowly than negative one. <laughs> this here is like a negative one power law um, index. Uh, and yeah, they argued, as you said, that if they were if it were to decay more slowly, it would have pathological properties for the representations. The manifold would no longer be smooth. So like small perturbations in, in, in image inputs would would like basically they would show up in like the high ranks. Species and they would like push the representations around wildly, and they, like you could move from like one point in representational space all the way to another point. Um, and uh, yeah, so we also see this up and down in the neural networks that we analyze. So like, we if you there are details of this, I'm happy to tell you a bit. People have questions about it, but like if you analyze the networks in the right way, you never see them decay more slowly than negative one parallel exponent. So it, this. I think there is something to this. We just don't fully understand it yet, uh, but it does seem like there is some upper bound of how how slowly it can decay. Yeah. This is one more burning question. Okay, I think we're thinking about the other question. Thank you. Thank you.